In these clips, we see B-24s attacking Iwo Jima's air bases and defensive installations. Just prior to the Marine landings, the 7th Air Force again sent B-24 bombers to Iwo Jima to bomb its gun and shore installations. During these attacks, though, the B-24 bombs were fitted with newly developed proximity fuses. This attack was significant as it was one of the first times proximity fuse bombs were used in combat. A proximity fuse bomb will airburst around 40 feet above the target, which will shower the area with high-velocity bomb fragments. The intent of this video is to review the B-24-3 attacks, characteristics of the bomb and proximity fuses, and evaluate the effectiveness of the attacks. The basis of this video will be this 1945 declassified report describing the proximity fuse Iwo Jima bombing and evaluating the performance of the attacks. As we walk through the attack narration and evaluation, the channel will provide points and annotations as needed for clarification. 1,100 VT fused bombs were used to attack Iwo Jima's defenses. A VT or variable time fuse is code for proximity fuse. B-24s of the 7th Air Forces attacked the island from February 10th through the 17th, 1945. Iwo Jima was invaded on February 19, 1945, two days after the last attack. This map from a 1945 9th Statistical Control Unit document outlines the 7th Air Force zones of operations. B-24 bases are here in the Marianas and Iwo Jima is located here. This chart outlines the weight of bombs dropped by the 7th Air Forces by plane type in month and year. B-24s dropped 2,001 tons of bombs during all of February 1945. Around 10% of these bombs were from the three proximity fuse bombing missions against Iwo Jima. The advantages of proximity fuses are described on this page from an Army Material Command handbook on bomb fuse selection. Proximity fuses detonate the bomb's explosive fill prior to target contact. They are airburst weapons. The sensor in the fuse starts the bomb's detonation train at distances around 40 feet from the target. The target zone will be showered by bomb fragments from above. An airbursting bomb can be more damaging to a target than a contact fuse bomb. Bomb fragments travel outward and downward at detonation. The fragment bias in a downward direction is from the bomb's imparted vertical speed. A hill or ditch can shield a soldier from a ground detonation. Airbursting bomb fragments, on the other hand, may be projected over these barriers. The height of detonation needs to be tune adjusted to allow the bomb fragments to travel over the obstacles, but not too high as to be outside the fragment's lethal range or optimum fragment strike density. Let's watch a video of proximity fuses in action. Key scientific figures in the development of the proximity fuse Merle II, Vannevar Bush, Alexander Elliott. Under Dr. Bush's direction, a thousand other scientists and many thousands of workers helped produce one of the war's most effective weapons. Its secret lay in a tiny, rugged radio tube, here compared with a regular tube, which made possible the installation, inside typical proximity fuses, of a complete two-way radio set. The fuse itself, containing the radio, the detonating cap, and other devices, is fitted into the nose of a bomb, rocket, or shell. Bombs are dropped which have been set to explode on contact. Obviously, they will not destroy shielded targets. They must make direct hits to be fully effective. Here, bombs with delayed action fuses fall. They penetrate far deeper than contact bombs, but their range of destruction is limited. The proximity or variable time fuse is exploded every time at the most effective distance from the target. A radio wave from inside the fuse bounces back from the target and sets off the explosive when the bomb is about 70 feet away from it. In diagram form, a contact bomb explodes like this. A delayed action bomb makes a deep hole but has little effect on the man in the foxhole or the jeep behind the barrier. But the next bomb bursts in the air. It is equipped with the proximity fuse called BT. In use against personnel and gun position, it was devastating. In the air and over land and water alike, the proximity fuse spreads explosive fury and produces vast destruction. It shot down 79% of German robot bombs in their last week over London. 
It shattered Japanese kamikaze suicide attacks. It was one of the most potent single weapons behind United Nations victory on two fronts. And its secret was never discovered by either the Germans or the Japanese. The first proximity fused Iwo Jima bomber attack occurred on February 10, 1945. 16 B 24s dropped 141 500 pound M64 general purpose bombs. The bombs were fitted with the T 50 E 4 proximity fuse and the M 100 series tail fuse. This table lists the maximum number of M64 bombs that can be carried within a bomb bay from a 1945 document on the tactical deployment of airburst fragmentation and general purpose bombs. A B 24 can carry 12 M64. 64 bombs. However, given the long range of the mission, the number of bombs carried was reduced to nine. This page from a 1945 Bombs and Fuses document outlines characteristics on a cutaway of the M64 500 pound general purpose bomb. The bomb is 57 inches in length, 14 inches in diameter, has a casing wall thickness of 0.3 inches, and its weight equates to 525 pounds when filled with 267 pounds of TNT. It's fitted with the T50E4 proximity nose fuse and the M101 tail fuse set for non-delay. The tail fuse is a redundant feature of the proximity proximity fuse fails to function. This page outlines characteristics and a cutaway of the T-50E4 proximity fuse. It is tuned to detonate between 10 to 40 feet above the ground. The rotating vanes will arm the bomb at a distance of 3,600 feet from release. Around 80% of the fuses will operate as intended. 15% will prematurely detonate and 5% will be duds. This map outlines the location, number, and size of Iwo Jima's flat guns as of January 1945 from a May 1945 Operations Analysis Report on Iwo Jima's flat guns. The bombers were likely attacking this position, targeting the northern six 120mm dual-purpose guns like seen in this image. The target was located in this area on these maps. The island is around 5 miles in length and 8 square miles in size. Eight planes attacked at altitudes of 15,000 feet and eight at 16,000 feet. The bombers' intervalometers were set to 100-foot bomb train spacing. This page evaluates the first attack. It is estimated based on images and interviews that only 60 to 70 percent of the VT fuses functioned correctly. A fuse arming delay recommended for releases at altitudes above 10,000 feet were not available. These delays reduce the possibility of premature fuse triggering while the bomb is in free fall. It is likely some of the 16 bombers set their intervalometers to spacing distances less than the recommended 100 feet. Both these factors caused early bombers. Testing showed VT fuse malfunctions occurred if the bomb's train spacing was too short during release. The fuse's proximity sensors were activated by the adjacent falling bombs. VT fused M64 500 pound general purpose bombs should be spaced at a distance of 100 feet or longer, and M81 fragmentation bombs to a distance of 50 feet or longer. Non delay backup tail fuses should be used for redundancy. Premature VT fuse detonations are minimized if formation integrity is maintained and bomb spacing guidelines are maintained. These plots represent a bomb's burst height based on speed and altitude of release. The expected burst height for a proximity fused M64 bomb is 25 feet if released from an altitude of 15,000 feet at a release speed of 210 miles per hour. For those bombs that did air burst properly, the bomb speed at detonation equated to 900 feet per second at a strike angle of 73 degrees from the horizontal. From this chart representing M64 strike speed and angle from a 1944 terminal ballistics data document. This graph outlines a proximity fused M64's bomb fragment strike per area that would cause a casualty. A casualty is defined as a fragment strike at an energy level of 58 foot pounds or higher, which is roughly the energy of a 40 grain 22 caliber bullet strike at a distance of 300 yards. The plot is valid for a bomb burst height of 30 feet at a bomb burst speed of 990 feet per second at a strike angle of 75 degrees from the horizontal. The shaded zones represent a casualty fragment strike per 1, 4, and 10 square feet. The strike area is not circular, given the bomb's angle, speed, and height at detonation. The bomb's initial casing fragment velocity is 7,390 feet per second, or Mach 6.6.
The second mission occurred on the next day on February 11, 1945. 20 B-24s attacked with 174 bombs and fuses identical to those used in the first mission. The target was in the same area as the first mission. Half of the bombs were released at an altitude of 12,500 feet and the other half at 15,000 feet. The intervalometer spacing was set to 125 feet to 150 feet to mitigate premature airburst detonations. It is estimated 75% of the proximity fuses function properly. There was no ground AA fire during this mission. Future attacks also indicated less ground AA fire. It is unknown, though, if this is due to the two B-24 attacks. The third and final VT bombing attack mission occurred on February 17, 1945, two days before the invasion. 40 B-24s carried 833 260-pound M81 fragmentation bombs. 96% of the bombs were fused with the T-50E1 proximity fuse. This page from a 1947 Bomb and Fuses document outlines characteristics on a cutaway of the M81 260-pound fragmentation bomb. The bomb is 44 inches in length, 8 inches in diameter, has a coil wall thickness of 1 inch, and its weight equates to 260 pounds when filled with 34 pounds of a Comp B explosive fill. The actual T-50E1 proximity fuse would look like this. The bomb's 34 pounds of composition B is here, and its 1 inch outer steel helical coil will fracture into thousands of pieces on detonation. The T50E1 fuse functions like the T50E4, but it's tuned for fragmentation and other types of bombs. They will not detonate the bomb properly if interchanged. The 40 B-24s attacked the Japanese southern beach defenses and other installations likely in this area. Altitude of release was between 4,500 and 5,500 feet. The intervalometer spacing was set between 100 and 150 feet. 90% of the bombs functioned properly. The M81's burst height is predicted to be around 21 feet if dropped from an altitude of 5,000 feet at a speed of 178 miles per hour. It is estimated the fragmentation bomb will burst when dropping at a speed of 580 feet per second at an angle of 70 degrees from the horizontal. This graph outlines an M81 bomb fragment per area that would cause a casualty. The plot is valid for a bomb burst height of 30 feet at a speed of 960 feet per second at an angle of 75 degrees from the horizontal. The bomb's initial coil fragment velocity is 3,410 feet per second or Mach 3.1. The casualty area zone of the M64 general purpose bomb is larger than the M81 fragmentation bomb. This is partially due to the M64 general purpose bomb having around eight times the explosive fill of the M81 fragmentation bomb, which gives its casing fragments a higher initial velocity. This table provides a comparison of the combat effectiveness of an airblast 500-pound general purpose bomb to an airblast 260-pound fragmentation bomb, where combat effectiveness is measured by the relative casualties at a distance away from the detonation site. For this row and column, a detonating M64 produces 2.5 times the casualties of a detonating M81 fragmentation bomb at a distance of 100 feet. Based on the data from this table, a 500-pound general purpose bomb is around twice as combat effective as a 260-pound fragmentation bomb. The 260-pound M81 fragmentation airburst along Iwo Jima's coastline can be seen in this image. This picture was taken during the third mission on February 17, 1945. We can estimate the fragment strike pattern and the bomb train spacing at between 100 and 150 feet. Definite information on the effectiveness of these three proximity fuse bombing missions can't be evaluated. This is due to isolating the bombing impacts from the other bombing missions and the naval bombardment that preceded the landings. It would just be too difficult. However, photographic evaluation does support the effectiveness of the B-24 VT bombing campaign as described. In general, the 7th Air Force attitude towards the new VT-fused airburst bomb was favorable. The fuse provided superior destruction of shielded material and personnel. Other voices expressed objection as to most Iwo Jima defenders were deeply entrenched, well covered, and therefore immune to the attacks. The bomb's train spacing limitations was not an issue as they regularly select intervalometer settings beyond the fuse minimums. If you've enjoyed this B-24 proximity fuse bomb attack on Iwo Jima and found it informative and worthy of your time, please consider supporting the channel by commenting, liking, and or subscribing to World War II U.S. Bombers.